Thank you. Um, uh, just to clarify, I am no longer on the board of any of those companies, so I feel like I need to get, get that out of there. They wised up. Uh, I'm not paid to be here, so you have to endure a 30-second ad, and I promise it won't be more than 30 seconds. Uh, we do three things. L2 does research. We're trying to establish the global seminal benchmark for digital competence. We believe what gets measured gets done, and we do this across several industries, helping our member brands zero on what they're weak at, what they're strong at across 350 points, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we do events, we're trying to do essentially a master's in digital marketing, host full days with Facebook, Apple, Google, et cetera, and then finally we do a lot of advisory work. So I'm headed to Berlin tonight, and one of the ways you can tell you're getting older, uh, there's three things I notice. One, I've, I have an un unnatural obsession with the weather all of a sudden, <laughs> and two, I'm convinced I have restless leg syndrome and any other ad I see for ill health uh, on TV. I'm, I'm obsessed with my own health. And the third is I have a newfound appreciation for history. And I like to put all of the work we do in some sort of a historical context. And tonight I'm getting on a plane uh, for Berlin. And I'm fascinated uh, with, especially with, with uh, war history. And I was thinking, I've been reading this wonderful book on the Cold War. And I was reading about the era where Sputnik was launched in October of 58. And you had a situation where effectively uh, you had this incredibly robust society, the US, being challenged by another one through technological sophistication that perhaps threatened their way of life or their way of being. And I thought there was an analogy here. I believe that your industry is having, if what you will, is a Sputnik moment. And so you think about going back to October of 58, and they put this, they, the Soviet Union, put this 175 kilo sphere the size of a basketball into the orbit, first time a man-made object was circling the Earth. And the scariest thing about it was that the radio signal it put out, and I think they did this purposefully, could be picked up on ham radio as it went over the fields of Kansas and the plains of Virginia, et cetera. So you'd hear this, bing, we're coming for you. Bing, we're smart. Bing, we're threatening your way of life. And this reaction, or this, this incredible volley from our competitors, inspired this reaction from uh, leaders and presidents to make these audacious, outrageous goals, including, a man, including putting a man on the moon. Incredible, speculative, irrational investments in math and science that spawned just an unbelievable growth in the technology sector that you could argue, as a result, has probably increased shareholder value more than any great any event in history. There was more wealth created in a seven mile radius of San Francisco International Airport in the 90s than all of Europe since World War II. We own technology and have for a long time. And these, this moment was really a key moment in our society. This is gonna seem a little obtuse for the next few minutes, but I promise to circle back to it at the very end. So let's set some context. And I'll get through this at a pretty, pretty decent clip because a lot of this you may have already seen before, but as, as it relates to media, corporations are lagging the consumer. This looks at the percentage of time we spend consuming media by channel versus where dollars are going. And most of you are going to forget more about this than I'm ever going to know. But the two things you zero in on are that we're spending approximately 5% of our total digital pie, if you will, reading newspapers, and approximately one in five corporate dollars marketing budgets still going to newspapers. This is a negative forward-looking indicator for the shareholders of the newspaper industry, because over time, there'll be, there'll be dips and valleys and peaks, but over time, these, these two should have some sort of equilibrium or some sort of gravitational pull towards each other. And then you look at the internet. Now, this number's gone up dramatically to spend. 19% of our budgets are now going to digital. That number's doubled just in the last 18 months. However, it's, it's unfairly juiced by some industries that spend 60, 70, 80% excuse me, of their budgets on digital. The number that's also not correct here is the number that says 25% of our time, or that's not relevant. Because if you're under the age of 40, that number goes to 40%. 40% of media consumption for people under the age of 40 is now uh, digital. And if you're under the age of 40 and making more than $50,000 a year, that all-important young affluent, their number has now breached 50%. So the lion's share of their media consumption is now taking place digitally. I even look to the product launches. I'm fascinated by this notion. There's so much hype around the iPhone launch. There's so much hype last week around the Amazon Fire. When I was a kid, the product launches we got excited about were cars. And now the product launches we get excited about are appliances such that we can do what? Consume more and more media. 
And that's sort of the good news, and I'll be talking about what I think is a lot of bad news for this industry, but the good news is the demand for your core product has never been more insatiable, right? The, the bad news is um, how do we pay for it seems to be under um, the, the, the kind of the tech business model around technology hasn't gotten the memo around the demand here, and it's increasingly, these business models are increasingly challenged. I was at a reunion of board members from one of the boards I ser or served on, and I had the pleasure of sitting next to Louis Gerstner, and I was complaining that you know, print revenue and newspapers had never been more relevant, and our views were more relevant, and, and people were looking at this on all types of devices, and he just sort of sat there and endured my, you know, my going on and on, and finally goes, well, if people aren't willing to pay for it, it's not relevant. And I found that really insightful. And I just had lunch with a guy who runs a large division of PBS, and I said to him, the reason you're having trouble making money is because you're no longer relevant. Right? Door is relevant. Animal Planet, Discovery are more relevant. Profits are an incredible sign, and margins are an incredible signal and indicator of relevance in our society. So that number is skyrocketing from our, uh, around the internet, around our, kind of our, the people who are going to repopulate our franchises. And Corporations are lagging this, the consumer in terms of investment. I'm going to talk a lot about Facebook, and you've heard a lot, uh, you know, I'm going to talk even more about Facebook, but I would argue there's not any, any uh, brand in here who is managing their capital allocation correctly as it relates to Facebook. You're all managers, or the majority of you are managers, and the only thing you have to do, the only thing you have to do and that you're charged by your shareholders and your board of directors with doing is managing capital allocation better than your competitive set. Taking a set of finite resources, which we're all, we're all dealt in terms of human creative and intellectual capital, and allocating it to a greater return than your competitive set. That's, that's your only job. And if you look at the opportunity around Facebook and the amount of capital you're allocating to Facebook, I would argue the music doesn't match the words. This is a, a wave graph showing the share of total um, internet time spent by Portal. So Yahoo, four years ago, controlled 6% market share. 6% of all time on the internet was on, an, on a Yahoo-owned domain. It's now less than 4%. Microsoft has gone from 4% to 25 basis points. Again, another negative looking forward indicator for shareholders. Google is less than you would think, because this is based on time, which is a little bit unfair, right? It's actually a search and destroy mechanism. We type in something, we get there, we spend more time on the destination site. YouTube is actually more in terms of market share by time. Google, great place to save time. YouTube, great place to waste time. <laughs> but look at Facebook. Facebook is now the market leader globally in terms of time spent on the internet. One in six minutes for women, one in eight minutes for men. We have never had a technology that's had this type of adoption, this type of influence this fast. Those all important young affluents under the age of 40, 22% of them, more than one in five, check Facebook before they get out of bed on their mobile phone. They're twice as likely in the last 24 hours to have been on Facebook than they are to have watched television. I mean, things are changing dramatically. In addition, and I have to credit uh, uh, Chris Anderson, the editor of Wired, there's something very special going on on the web, and his statement was provocative and there was some truth that the web is dying. People are leaving the web and going to social media platforms and mobile applications. And we never would have thought that even two or three years ago, that they would abandon our basic, our, our direct URLs, our sites, such that they could spend more time or not on our or our competitive um, uh, players' uh, social media platforms. This is, again, just goes to the scale of Facebook. This is the number of images that little dot in the southwest corner is pulled out and you see the orange square. And within that, we have all the photos on Instagram, all the images from the library conference, all the images from Flickr. That makes up that little orange dot in the southwest corner. The rest is imagery on Facebook. Uh, we've all heard that, that uh, web browsing is now ahead, uh, excuse me, more people are browsing from their phones than from, than from their desktop uh, devices. There was some incredible data that came out from Flurry it was one of those charts we saw at L2 that kind of took out, gave us pause, and it was that people are now in the US spending more time on their mobile device either playing games or checking their status or on social media platforms than they are browsing the web. Think about how that changes the ecosystem, capital allocation, more time on your phone on these two things, games and social media, than browsing the web. That was just unthinkable. Now, we have a tendency, especially at conferences, and the role of an academic is the pursuit of truth, regardless of who it offends. 
And I hope, I, you know, and I, I hope I generally live up to that in almost every speech I give. But this essentially looks at the revenues from classified advertising, which was the white meat of the newspaper business, and then also correlated against Google revenue. And if you ran these numbers in an unbiased way to give them to a statistician, he or she would say there's a strong correlation between the decline in revenues of classified advertising and newspapers and the increase in revenues of Google. Right? Effectively, this was a $10 billion business at the beginning of the decade for the newspaper industry. Now it's a $700 million business. I believe your business is somewhere around 2002, and that is you have benefited from what I'd call a cyclical recovery, but you're still in the midst of a structural decline because the industry has not responded in a like manner in terms of the technological sophistication or the competence of the players who are threatening your business. I believe your industry is on the, the verge of a massive double dip. I think that double dip is largely gonna be fomented by Facebook. Facebook's primary value proposition, as I see it, is to aggregate, or the branded pages of Facebook, is to aggregate niche uh, uh, demographics that are very attractive to advertisers. I believe that that was the primary, or is the primary value proposition of a lot of people in the room, that they bring together this incredible consistency of editorial voice, such that they can attract these incredibly rich target demographics that they then rent out. Facebook is now at $2 billion. Your industry's flat. I believe this industry has benefit, benefited from a cyclical recovery. But we tend to talk about ne new technologies as if they're just additive, that Google, Google every once in a while tries to save bookstores. They talk about how much traffic they're sending to news sites. And to me, this always rings of when hunters talk about being conservationists. It just doesn't ring true to me. Google has gone into the vaults of the newspaper industry and has sucked the oxygen out of the air. A third of the newspapers in this country are out of business, and the, another third are dead. They just don't know it yet. They're zombies. Let's look at what's happening on Facebook. These are the number of likes for brands relative to uh, some of the most uh, famous, uh, I look a lot at the prestige industry, some of the most famous books that carry the advertising of these brands. So we have the US circulation, or excuse me, the global circulation, is this cosmopolitan? Is this the US or the global circulation? Does anyone know? US circulation at three million, Glamour at 2.3. Burberry is now at eight and a half million, right? It strikes me that something called social media is somewhat, it's somewhat ironic that brands are out ahead of media companies in this medium. Face, uh, Burberry made what was a speculative investment in Facebook, they said, we are gonna go hard at this. We're gonna spend millions of dollars on this platform. And they were spending millions of dollars on Facebook before it was cool, and they've aggregated eight and a half million followers. By our estimates, that means that within a year, they're probably gonna be somewhere between 13 and 15 million likes or followers. This is 13 to 15 million people who have raised their hand and said, I wanna have a direct relationship with you, the brand. And I will likely read a great deal of what you send out on a daily basis, examine it, shop, listen to your ads, listen to your tweets from Christopher Bailey, what have you. So the issue is once they get there, it's logical to think that one, somewhere between a third and two thirds of the 1.3 million people that subscribe to Vogue will already have a direct relationship with Burberry. And so the, the question I put forward to the good people at Condé Nast is Burberry likely to spend more or less of the same on your book moving forward, unless you can figure out a way to get out ahead and establish more relationships with them. The response, I believe is fairly uninspired around Facebook in your industry. If all of a sudden Vogue and Cosmo and Elle started producing trench coats and doing a great job, I think the response from Burberry would be much greater than, than it has been the equivalent response from your industry around Facebook. Now you might say that's unfair. Let's look at, let's look at kind of uh, uh, apples to apples. So this is, we're looking at um, a number of likes I was looking at likes versus subscriptions. Now let's just look at likes to likes, right? So again, you see these brands, some of the biggest advertisers are three, four, five times si uh, the community, sizes of the community. And this is gonna have unforeseen impact, right? Everyone was saying in the two, three years ago, show me the ROI. Scott, we'll, we'll put $10 million of Facebook if you show me the ROI. And I'd say, you know what? I can't show you the ROI. This is a speculative leap of faith if you buy this is the next big thing. I couldn't show you the ROI on Google. When I was at Red Envelope in 99 and they, the head of sales for 
Google came to me and said, you can order, you can own every term related to gifts, Mother's Day, engagement party for 40,000 a month. I said, you know, I don't, I, don't, I don't see the numbers. It feels like a weird audience. I don't really understand technology. I need to build brands the real way. I need to be in print and on billboards and, and on the sides of buses and create this emotional, tactile feeling. Blue Nile, my closest competitor in terms of funding, they smelled, looked, and feel the same of us, said, we're going all in on Google. They didn't do any broadcast advertising. They took their entire $20 million marketing budget, which was the same as mine, and they put it all at Google. If you typed in Tiffany in the year 2000, you got a Blue Nile. If you typed in engagement ring, you got Blue Nile. Blue Nile has a market capitalization of 550 million. Red Envelope does not. I believe that was a seminal moment where they went all in on a new technology, and I believe Burberry's done the same thing. It's gonna pay off, and it already is starting to. We track 800 brands upstream traffic. We look at where 800 brands are getting visitors to their sites, and the number one across 799 of them is Google, except for one. As of three months ago, the number one source of upstream traffic to Burberry is now their Facebook page. So not only are they gonna be able to take money and reduce, in my opinion, broadcast spending because they have direct relationships, they're likely gonna to get to reduce their spending and it's a massive spend on Google AdWords because they are now have a lower source of cost of traffic coming from Facebook and they're getting more people from there. This is playing out in terms of the actual ad rates. If you look at the CPMs, of banner ads, because people again are leaving the web and the amount of content on the web doubles every year, the CPMs have actually declined 30% year on year. They're down 50% over the last 12 months. The bottom line, and people don't like to talk about this at conferences because they're generally up here hawking the shareholder value of either their company or they wanna be in partnership with you, is that internet media does not work. It's a terrible business. If you took, in 2009, there was a study done by a Dartmouth professor that was reported in the New York Times. If you took the entire EBIT, the entire profit of all internet media, including Google, the ad exchanges, the ads on Huffington Post, all your advertising revenue, you got profits of $10 billion, right? Google that same year did 12 billion in EBIT. So there's Google, and then everyone else was losing a combined cumulative, cumulative $2 billion. And the reason why is we, for the, since World War II, been in a mindset as media companies, and I use we because I've spent a lot, of, a lot of time and money investing in media companies, we bought into this notion, aggregate an audience, rent it, sell the eyeballs. But guess what? Technology did not get the memo on our business model. And now with contextual retargeting and the internet, they can follow people to the lowest cost of serving them an ad, and we are in an inexorable downward spiral in terms of pricing that we can't snap out of. And the biggest mistake we made as print media companies was allowing, to go it was allowing Google to crawl our information for free. What a dumb ass move. That, that, that will haunt us for the rest of our lives. Do you think Disney lets YouTube take all their stuff, parse it, separate it from their consumers and then reserve it? And they say, but we send millions of people to your sites. But the bottom line is we can't monetize it to the same extent. Intention gets 10 to 50 times the monetization rate of that same person once they're at your site serving them an ad. This model does not work. And unless there are some huge structural changes and there's a lot of adult conversations and a lot of real leadership in this industry around partners, around facilitate, facilitating real competition and searching in tablets, you are gonna be on the wrong end of this structural change, just as you are now. How am I doing? <laughs> Thanks for that, I thought I was on the verge of getting kicked out. So, <laughs> look at the price to buy AdWords, up 4% and 11% respectively for being in, being in Google. Cost, CPC, cost per click advertising on Facebook is up 40% year on year. I have been to this movie. When that guy from that nice man who's now running AOL came to me and said, Scott, we're gonna give you all the keywords on Google, right? And I said, how much was it? He said, 40,000 a month. Within 24 months, that number was 200,000 a month. You are gonna look back on these days and say, those were the salad days when we could have gone to 10 million likes 
and it's prohibitively, it's gonna get prohibitively expensive. The cost to get a like, the cost to build the communities on these emerging platforms, the cost for you to establish those direct relationships and get back out ahead of the brands who are about to excise the publisher's tax from this ecosystem is gonna be more expensive tomorrow, more expensive the next day. Just as I look back in 99 and think, why wasn't I buying every keyword known to man? And then it got prohibitively expensive. We're gonna look back on social media now and say the investments we were making were short-sighted and incredibly anemic. These are the salad days. You want a social media strategy? You want a Facebook strategy? I'm an entrepreneur. I like robust ecosystems. I'm betting I like the guys from Tumblr. I like the guys from Twitter. They're powerful, powerful platforms. Facebook is killing everybody. Facebook, this, this looks at total time spent on every platform combined, that's the green bar, and then the amount of time spent on Facebook. Facebook is either number one in every market or gaining share on the number one. They're either, they're either number one or gonna be number one in two years if they continue with the exception of China that's made it illegal to access Facebook. I'm gonna skip that. Think of Facebook as a marketplace. I spend a lot of time with boards, and every other word out of a CEO's mouth is usually something, something China, something, something China, right? 1.3 billion consumers, average GDP of $3,400, just 99th, just behind Bosnia, Herzegovina, but an incredibly attractive market, incredible increase in disposable income, a consumer that loves aspirational brands, has suffered under a totalitarian regime, wants to spread their feathers, wants to show the world who they are as individuals. We love this market, right? And there's a lot of reasons to be excited about it. But think of Facebook as a marketplace for your brands. 1.3 billion versus 800 million. Average GDP about 3,400 bucks. 50% of the people on Facebook make at least $50,000 a year. 50% of the people on Facebook are either in college or have graduated from college. 40% of the people on Facebook or a third of a billion people follow a brand and 50% of those people or 160 million say they will buy from that brand they are following in the next 60 days. Your biggest opportunity globally is not China, it's Facebook. Now look at the amount of attention, oxygen in the boardroom, big statements, consultants, capital, intellectual, financial, and human you are spending and allocating on China, and look at the amount of capital you are allocating to Facebook, and you tell me, does the music match the words? Let's talk about the Digital IQ Index for magazines. We are trying to establish the benchmark. People have a general idea how they're doing online, but they don't really know how they're doing relative to their peer group on a granular level. They don't know how to hold their management accountable. They don't know how to hold themselves accountable to their shareholders. They have an idea, they get awards, but they're not really sure across all these dimensions how they're doing exactly. We go out and we measure 350 data points across every brand in the study, across four dimensions, the site, digital marketing, mobile, and social media. It takes approximately 1,500 staff hours just to collect the data. These, as far as we know, are the largest, the, the largest studies of their kind by a factor of five or 10 in terms of just the amount of gross data that's collected. We then take the average score across those four dimensions and we, take the, and we index it to 100, similar to an IQ, right? Mean across our, our population is 100 IQ. We then take the remaining brands and their scores and parse them into five categories. Genius, gifted, average, challenged, and feeble. These are not terms we made up. These are the terms that are actually used to describe people in these IQ classes. The key here is that you can zero in on where you're weak and where you're strong relative to your competitive set on a very granular level. Why is that important? The areas you're weak in are the cheapest to fix. It costs hundreds of thousands, sometimes tens of thousands of dollars to go from being feeble to average it costs millions to go from being average to gifted. So sometimes the opportunities are greatest where you are weakest. Those are the easiest to fix. The areas you're strongest relative to a competitor might offer some sort of strategic advantage or true competitive differentiation relative to your competitive set. The IQ dispersion. There seems to be a templatization taking place because this industry is somewhat consolidated. So when people find something that works, they spread it across multiple titles and we have a strong clustering around the average and gifted ranking. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the ranking. I'm gonna start from average, and I'm gonna to go to gifted, and then I'm gonna to go to genius. I was asked not to list 
the feeble or the challenged, and I'm going to respect that. But if you want to be embarrassed in private, please go to our website and download, <laughs> download our study. In terms of the feeble, this isn't an issue of people not doing a great job. It's not a statement on the people actually running the digital groups. It's a statement on capital allocation. The people in charge of, of capital allocation have basically decided for the feeble brands that digital is just not an investment they want to make. Their sites are basically placeholders. In the feeble, in the, excuse me, in the challenge categories, you generally have a decent site, but very little kind of scant social media stops and starts, almost no mobile, no real commerce taking place to think of. When you get to average, you have strong sites. They're doing a decent job, good aesthetics, strong reinforcement of the message. You opt into an email, you hear back in a timely fashion. Maybe there's even a link to a product or a social media platform. They're doing a pretty decent job. What they're not doing a great job of is they're not integrating social media. There's no cross-platform cross programming, no inspiration around taking great, uh, uh, great themes and programming and the uh, hard copy and bringing it online and into the various satellites around social media, and very little mobile taking place. Also not entirely robust SEO optimization, and again, some of the CRM is lacking. Then we get into the clustering where there's a lot of brands doing a good job, and this is the gifted ranks. What you find here is people starting to take social media seriously, making big investments. Maybe they have an individual who has the street or has the credibility within the organization to get things done, right? Decide something's good, has the budget to hire the best vendors, has the ear of the president or the CEO of the organization, is even making some speculative investments around this area, around mobile, around tablets. Right? We're starting to see that mobile right, and then social media are the primary points of differentiation across our four dimensions. Right? Most people do a pretty good job of site. Most people do a decent job of digital marketing. The thing that's differentiating the players from average to genius are what they're doing around social media and what they're doing around mobile. And then the genius brands, and I'll read them from the 10th to 1st, Cosmopolitan, Entertainment Weekly, Glamour, GQ, New York Magazine, Men's Health, Sports Illustrated, Self, People, and Time. Time was a shock for us. We all took bets at the beginning of every study. We've done this across 12 industries, and it was shocking to see Time come in number one. These are brands that have decided the following. This is a strategic investment for us. We want to be best of class. And even if I don't get short-term ROI on something around a tablet, something around social media, I'm confident that signaling to the marketplace that I'm an innovator will create a brand aspiration that's worth the investment, or a brand association that's worth the investment. And again, the example here is Burberry. We track every program. We have a crawling program. When there's a spike in traffic on a brand, we go in and we see what they're doing. There's this cover girl, just in case you're interested, their Facebook page is going crazy today. So we went in and found out it's a sampling program that features Taylor Swift that's supported with a print campaign, by the way, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts when you do across these different platforms. There is a cumulative effect, and their Facebook page is skyrocketing right now. These people will say, OK, if I can, in fact, create this association, I'll get return at some point. Right? And Burberry's example, three years ago, Burberry meant British and plaid. Now it means British, plaid, and innovative. You cannot get through an earnings call without hearing the term digital from Angela Aarons, the CEO, 50 to 70 times. And guess what? The rest of the industry is turning at eight times EBITDA. Her brand is turning at 11 times. Her revenue is up 40%. Why? Because the cool kids, the new young affluent, and by the way, we're no, longer, we're no longer the target market. There's now more Gen Y than baby boomers. The new kids on the block that are driving and repopulating our franchises, they want innovation from these brands. They want to get a sense that you're doing interesting things. And right now, social media, is the least expensive way to build that association into your brand. This is the equivalent of corporate skinny jeans. You become much younger <laughs> and much hipper and much more relevant through innovative programming on mobile and social media. So some of the things around social media. This looks at the green bar is an index number around your subscriber bases relative to your populations on the two platforms, Facebook and Twitter. As you can see, the populations on Facebook and Twitter are going to double over the next 12 months. Meanwhile, estimates are that the subscriber base is going to stay flat or even decline a little bit. So we have incredible growth on these platforms in this room. 
These are the brands that are overperforming. These are the brand, this, this 45 degree line effectively looks at what these brands should be doing relative to the subscriber base. And what you find is there's not a very strong correlation. Having a large subscriber base doesn't necessarily translate to a large community on these platforms. The skill sets seem to be disparate, which is an opportunity for the smaller players and an opportunity to reshuffle the deck, because I think a lot of times the big guys oftentimes think that anything they go into, they're gonna have a natural advantage, and they usually do. And in this case, they don't seem to. But some of the overachievers that are uh, above the 45 degree line, relative to their subscriber, si subscriber size, subscription base, excuse me, they are growing their populations on Facebook and Twitter and YouTube faster than what would be indicated by their subscriber bases. This is around Twitter. Still a lot of low-lying fruit, right? So you have only 13% solicit user-generated content. That's gonna change. There's a great cosmetics brand called Bear Essentials that has a really robust social media platform. 98% of the content on their Facebook page is generated by women helping other women with beauty tips. Uh, only a quarter are using gated Facebook tabs. That's how you segment your users and get them to a more robust offering on Facebook. Um, Two-thirds reply to a followers, or another way to look at that is one-third do not. And less than half actually tweet out the links to articles in the hard copy, or the digital copy, excuse me. And only a third promote their events that they're having online on these platforms. We then look at size of the community on one axis relative to engagement on the other axis. Everyone talks about that big, shiny, whizzing number of the size of your community. The next metric is gonna be engagement. That is how many people are actually really listening and responding. And the way we measure that is we look at every piece of content you put out, and we see how many people are liking it or commenting on that. And we think of that as an engagement or a two-way dialogue. Again, it's supposed to be social media, right? Not one way, not broadcast media. The only brand that's been able to combine and get to that all-important quadrant one that has both a large population on its, on its Facebook page and is managing to create content, even among that large base, that results in high levels of engagement is parents. And you see some other magazines doing very well. Incredible engagement for Field and, Field and Stream and Architectural Digest. Incredibly huge followings on People and Playboy, but not the same level of engagement. And we've, we've parsed these into four categories. Families, meaning high level of engagement, but small. Right? Crowds, huge populations, but low levels of engagement. Cohorts, that was basically a generous way to say you're not doing either very well and then tribes, which we saw as the powerful quadrant one. Okay, let's look at the top 10, and this kind of reveals a bias in the data, and that is time did not, these are the, these are the number, the brands that came in number one across our four dimensions. The site itself, and on the site, we look at everything from how long it takes to load the site. More than a second half, people leave. Right. How easy is it to get to a point of action, either a subscription or an article or what have you? We then look at digital marketing, SEO, CRM, et cetera, social media, and mobile. These are the brands that scored number one across each dimension. And what you look at is our winner didn't score number one across any of them, but they're doing an adequate job across all of them. Right? So we reward a balanced scorecard approach, because at this point in time, we're not exactly sure which one is gonna be more important than the other. The notion that site would become this unimportant relative to your digital IQ, relative to mobile and social media, even two years ago would be unthinkable. So to be, in our view, really relevant in digital, you're gonna to have to place a few chips down on a number of numbers, if you will. So we, we rewarded time with the number one spot because they are doing a very good job across the entire spectrum. Then you look at people, number one in digital marketing, then our number three, self. Again, not number one in oh, uh, not number one in any category, but confident across all the dimensions. So, what's happened since then? We wanted to talk a little bit about, and Howard asked us to talk about, do an update. The people can download the reports. So we said accurately, talk about something that in fact is new here. What's happened since then? And there's some exciting things taking place in the industry. The good news is the pace of innovation in this industry is dramatic. The bad news is if you're just kind of chugging along at a jog, you're gonna get blown by by the people who are sprinting. This industry to a certain extent has, has, has jumped in and the pace 
of investment has, has, has uh, increased dramatically. We still don't believe it's anywhere near where it's going to be, but it has increased dramatically. So some of the things people's doing, and we're gonna talk about the social media dimension, they've done a great job of taking this fantastic brand or programming, if you will, in terms of the sexiest man alive, putting it on Facebook, having people vote, and have exploded their Facebook community or have added a greater number of likes with this great cr cross-platform marketing. In terms of mobile, National Geographic has recognized that their assets and their brands are highly linked to imagery and photography, so they're encouraging their users to use Instagram to, to solicit photos or gather photos, upload them, and then there's an opportunity to actually be featured in the magazine. Again, get great cross-platform, innovating around mobile, sending to that younger generation, we get it, we are innovative, we're interested in crowdsourcing and doing interesting things. Lucky, fantastic use of partners, partnered with Bergdorf Goodman and said, we're gonna do a casting call for our five, I think it was called Face, Fresh Faces of Fall, and ask them, Facebook, to nominate and to send in pictures of people. Got tremendous response, again, a fantastic way to do cross-platform integration. And then finally, in terms of the site itself, The Economist does a great job of developing these really robust interactive tools on the site where they have live debates, real-time infographics, Right. Uh, opinion polls that are live, really engaging the user, some of the highest time on site scores we registered in the study. So this is where I'm gonna try and bring it, bring it all back, and then I think hopefully we'll have a few minutes for Q&A. Going back to that one slide, I do believe there's an analogy here to where this industry is relative to where the US was in the late 50s, and that is you are being severely and significantly threatened by another force, and you could say it's Apple, you could say it's Amazon, you could say it's Google, right? They're more technologically sophisticated than you at this point, right? And our notion is that there needs to be more leadership, more audacious goal setting, a greater appreciation and investment in technology, and a leveraging of some of the unbelievable assets you have, right? There is no reason why Burberry should have triple or quadruple the followers that some of the brands in this room have. It's social media, for God's sakes. How did a trench coat company get this far out ahead of you? <laughs> Your livelihood is being threatened. There is no way, no way to sugarcoat this. There needs to be adult conversations about how this industry gets more players around key parts of the value chain, around search, around tablets. Why is Apple so damn hard to deal with? Because they can be. If you had 90% market share, you'd be difficult to deal with, right? But there's absolutely nothing wrong with, with this industry that can't be fixed with what's right with it. If someone were to say in three years, who are, who are the dominant players in social media? A decent bet would be the brands in this room. Smart people coming after you, requisite leadership, Make these big investments, they will pay off. Bing, bing, that's all I have. Don't, don't give him to him, he sounds angry. If digital history shows us anything, today's leaders, tomorrow's wannabe. Your early chart showed Yahoo was once king of all, yeah. and they're now down. Yeah. Do you foresee that the same thing will happen to Facebook, that eventually they will be supplanted by some other entity? Yeah, can you introduce yourself? I'm at an advantage. Uh, Bo Sachs. Everybody knows me. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much for your question. So look, so let's talk about Yahoo, all right? Yahoo's getting a lot of, 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 of criticism right now, but Yahoo's an incredible company that created a tremendous amount of shareholder value for billions in shareholder value for people in a short period of time. So, you know, Yahoo definitely has lost a lot of innovation. They've had management problems. In my view, the board hasn't done a great job. A board's job is to pick the right CEO and to know when to sell the company. This board has not done a great job at either. But I, 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 I think Yahoo's a success story. I think a lot of the brands in this room would pray for Yahoo's problems in terms of the shareholder creation they accreted for people off of a fairly small base over the last 10 years. Now, going to your question about Facebook, um, 
I believe Facebook's gonna be the most valuable company. A year ago I said I believe Facebook was gonna be the most valuable company in the world in 36 months. I, get, I advise hedge funds and they call me and say, and I've get, I, I don't get as many of these calls, but I was getting them a lot about six, nine months ago, and I've been getting them for about 18 months, and the call will go like this. Scott, we've just got a call. You know you can buy Facebook shares in the open market, and they, but they want a valuation of $3 billion. And I know it's transformative, but is it really worth $3 billion? I said, well, I don't know, but I think at some point it's going to be worth the most valuable company in the world. I don't know if it's going to go up or down from here, but I do believe if you look at any technology in history that's been able to aggregate more people and more eyeballs and more time and more influence, at some point it becomes one of the most valuable companies in the world, whether it's Netscape, Microsoft, AOL. At some point, that valuation just gets ridiculously crazy because they figure out a way to start monetizing that access. Facebook has now got a valuation of about $80 billion. Uh, Exxon, I think, is about 320. Apple's about 350. I do think in the next 24 months we're going to have a moment where Facebook is the most valuable company in the world. My other prediction is that in 10 years it won't be one of the top 100. You know, the pace of innovation around young people, around the people, you, your kids that are in our schools, is so exciting. And there's access to capital, and the, you know, other than great brands, you know, and Facebook's challenge will be to build an unbelievable brand such that they can get into different things and adapt. But the pace of change here is just the cycle time is narrowing. But right now, it's hard to imagine that Facebook's going to be unseated about everything. Everyone got all excited about Google+. Plus. I believe Google+, Plus is effectively going to go away in 12 months. They'll, it'll be peace with honor. They'll integrate it into Gmail, and they'll call it a, a feature. Every day, every day, Facebook is adding the population of Miami. You know, people get excited. People get excited about, uh, now I'm really going to go off base here, but. The, the Google, I mean, Google is so dominant, so incredibly dominant, makes so much money. And something I didn't get to, and I'm using your question as an excuse to talk about what I want to talk about. But uh, George Stephanopoulos is up next. He knows about that. Anyways, if you, no, I mean, he, he knows about it from his guests. You ask questions, and then they just break into song. Uh, they have nothing to do with, with, with what he asked. Uh, he's fantastic, by the way. I love him. So. Look at what's happened. You know, we're getting so excited. People say, well, who's doing this well in this industry online? And people say, usually say the Huffington Post. The Huffington Post, right? Last year, the Huffington Post did $30 million. It's supposed to do 70 this year. But last year, it did $30 million. I'm going to get on a plane to Berlin tonight. By the time I get on, by the time I get off, Google will have made more than $30 million. That's a fact. Until every person in this room figures out how to do one of three things, tap into search revenue, by creating a viable second competitor to Google. The best thing that happened to the people in this room happened a few days ago when Amazon launched the Fire. Things are about to get a lot better in terms of negotiating with tablet people when there's a viable number two. Until there's a viable number two in search, which is the white meat of this business, we are all challenged. Because that is where the money is in internet media. And this is going to require a very high level, concerted, thoughtful response. Right? And as you can imagine, I don't get a lot of invitations to go speak at Google right now. Right? I don't know where I was going with that. Did I answer your question? <laughs> sort of? Partially? Thank you for your question. Yeah. It's Mitt Romney. <laughs> it's Kelly Dane. It's a word. OK. Not Mitt Romney. Um, so uh, two, two, two questions or points. First is, uh, to the analogy with the space shock, uh, I, I would argue that actually space shot is probably the wrong mentality now because part of the problem with the social world is the world changes too fast and Facebook in a way is like a giant second life where every uh, two months they reinvent the landscape. So for example, your, your point about Burberry is very well taken, but that really has to do with the fact that you can buy likes. And in mm -hmm. fact, the social natives that are probably more likely your real competition on Facebook haven't got mm -hmm. the budget to buy them right now. They're mm -hmm. growing organically. Mm -hmm. Pretty soon they will. The, you're, you're, it isn't, it isn't the competition on Facebook is going to be the social natives. And the right way to spend is not the moonshot spend, but the very agile iterative spend. Uh, so is it, is it spending to, to acquire followers? Uh, or likes, or is it great organic programming and leveraging your brand equity in an authentic way to get great followers where there's higher engagement? And the answer is yes. Uh, you're going to need to do both. You know, one, you can't control. Right? North Face's and REI, these wonderful street cred brands, are going to get a lot of natural organic followers. Hermes has some of the highest engagement online because it's 
they haven't spent a lot of money to acquire like Burberry. They have a smaller base and a very highly engaged audience because it's such a deep, wonderful, seeped in tradition, historical, historical, wonderful brand, right? But Burberry said, we're going at this hard. If we can be at 20 million people, 20, we're going to be able to figure out unbelievable ways to monetize that. And we're going to shift the balance of power between us and Google, between us and Condé Nast and Hearst, right? And between us and young people in terms of the aspirational value. There is no getting around it. This is going to require speculative investment, whether, whether it's around programming that creates that authenticity, doing really innovative, unique things, maybe offline some great programming that has to reach, that rewards your Facebook community. You know, there's a, there's, there's a lot of great ways to spend money, right? And, and a lot of the sponsors here will help you. But there's, there's tremendous, there's, the headline news is the following. I believe, and we've shown this, we take our data and we give it to the finance department at NYU. And we have shown a statistically significant correlation between digital IQ and year-on-year -year revenue growth and shareholder value. This means the following. The people in the feeble, in our feeble chart, will not grow their revenues as fast as the people in the genius chart. And you might say, well, Scott, there's some noise in that data because it's a causality issue because it's not being digital that drives shareholder value. It's the fact that that's an indication or a symptom of a strong management team that's progressive, understands data, risk capital, good return on invested capital. And my response would be, who cares? The point is, once you become a genius, you're more likely to drive shareholder value above and beyond your competitive set. That is the one thing you can link on right now, and I've got the proof. If you go from your category up, you are going to outperform your peers in terms of return to your stakeholders. I got a question for you. Are you pro-life or not? <laughs> that was a joke. That was a joke. That was a joke, sorry, go ahead, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm supposed to wrap up. Last question, are we done? We're done, I appreciate your time, thank you.